ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعه اما بعد فيا عباد الله اوصيكم واوصي نفسي بتقوى الله اتقوا الله في السر والعلانيه واتقوا الله ويعلمكم الله we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we send peace and blessings upon his noble messenger and his family and his wives and his companions and all of those who follow them until the day of judgment. And I begin by enjoining you and enjoining myself to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, avoiding the prohibitions of Allah outwardly and inwardly and fulfilling the commands of Allah outwardly and inwardly. One of the things that we find in the Quran is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes gives us a portion of a story and does not give us all of the story. But He's teaching us a lesson through that story and one of the many lessons is for us to use our intellect. Do you not, uh, or so that you may do, use your aql, use your intellect. So when we look at the stories of the Qur'an, we should not just brush over them, we should rather look deeply into them. We should look deeply into the stories, look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is indicating through those stories, and then see how those stories relate to our lives, and how we can use them in bettering our Islam, and bettering our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and bettering our relationship with the creation around them, us. So I'd like to point our attention to one of the stories that's mentioned in Surah Al-Hashr. And it's not an entire story, it's just an example. كَمَثَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِذْ قَالَ لِلْإِنسَانِ كَفُرْ فَلَمَّا كَفَرَ قَالَ إِنِّي بَرِيءٌ مِّنْكَ إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهَ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Allah says, it is like the example of the shaytan who told the human being, make kufr, do kufr, disbelieve in Allah. Deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then when he made kufr, the shaytan told him, I am absolved of you. I have nothing to do with you. The siyaq of the ayah seems that it happened immediately. It looks like the shaytan said, do kufr, and then he immediately did kufr. But when we look into the tafsir and we look into the hadith about the explanation of this story, this story was not continuous in that fashion. That was the beginning. <clears throat> Uh, or that was the end of the story. What happened was in a long story without going into all of the details, but there was a monk from Bani Israel. There was a person who was a worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the shaytan could not come to him directly and say, disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As is the case with the believer, the shaytan knows that he cannot come to us directly and say, leave this Islam that you're upon. Leave this iman, this faith that you have in your heart. He knows that he can't get that from us directly. That is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected in the hearts of the believers. So he has to use strategy. He's using strategy and strategies of war and strategies of influence and strategy of uh, changing the behavior of people. He's using all of these strategies. That's why it's important to see what his strategies are. Look at what is mentioned in the Quran. And what the ulama have, have mentioned as examples of his strategies. So he comes to this monk, and now he wants to get him off of the path. Not just get him off of the path of worship, but the ultimate goal for the shaytan, for the devil, is to remove faith from our hearts. People would find that if they removed faith from their hearts, so many other things would become easy. He doesn't mind if we fast day and night. He doesn't mind if we fast every day and pray day and night and make pilgrimages. If we're doing that just out of custom and just to fulfill our own nafs, not basing it on faith, he doesn't mind that. He'll let us go on those things. But what he wants from us is our faith, our iman. But again, he can't come to us directly and remove it from our hearts. So how does he do it? Allah is showing us in this story. The shaitan comes to him and wants to remove the iman from his heart, but he knows he has to go tadriji and he has to go step by step, little by little. So he goes and he whispers to some people who are about to travel, put your sister in the care of this monk. He's the best person for you to take care of your sister. 
They come to the monk, and at first the monk says, No, I cannot take on this trust. I cannot take on this amana because I am afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I'm afraid of taking care of this woman on my own in my monastery. The shaitan goes back to the brothers, gets them more convinced. No, he's the best person. There's nobody else. The brothers go back to him. They convince him finally. He brings her into the monastery, puts her into a, a room on her own and then, and then would bring the food, knock on the door, place it and then leave out of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After bringing the food, he's staying away. This is taqwa. This is staying away from the haram. Putting multiple, multiple barriers between you and the haram. This is what he's maintaining. And he would go back to his room and put his hand over a candle, near a candle till it warms up and says, remember the fire of Allah to stay on this. But then the shaitan now comes and whispers to him. He says, because he whispered to him at the first place, take her in, it'll be okay, and so forth. Now she's in the room. Instead of just placing the food, open the door. She's lonely, her family's away from her, so on and so forth. He opens the door. You can imagine the rest of the story. Little by little, he falls into the haram. Without going into all of the details. But he falls into the haram, and now he's overwhelmed with guilt and remorse. And yes, despair from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now here comes the shaitan to whisper to him again. Commit murder, cover up your crime, bury her, and tell everybody that she ran away. When the brothers come back, he tells this lie. The shaitan whispers to them, go look in the monastery. They find the, the, the person. Now they know the crime has been committed. They pull him out of the monastery, going to have the, 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 the court and so forth. And now imagine this person. Think of, a, think of a, a, a righteous member of our community at the, at the pinnacle of our community that we look up to, that we respect, that we look at as a representative of the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we go to these men of Allah, these men of God, we're saying, teach us what Allah wants us to know. Pray for us. You are closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was the status of that person, not just an average man in the marketplace. But these are the people that shaitan is after because he knows that if he can make one of these pillars of the community fall, so many of the general public will fall. So many followers of this person will fall. And then there's no more examples of, to, to lead us, for us to emulate. So now as this pillar of the community is being pulled out, and you can just imagine the shame that he has going from this high rank, this maqam that Allah has given him, down to being pulled out to a court and being shamed publicly. The shaitan comes to him and says, if you do kufr, if you disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'll save you from this scenario. And at that point, the person rejects Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is where the story in the Quran mentions, كَمَثَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِذْ قَالَ لِلْإِنسَانِ كفر. The likeness, the example of the shaitan when he told the man, make kufr. Then when he made kufr, when he disbelieved, I'm totally, I absolve myself of you. When he did the kufr, when he made the kufr, the monk, then the shaitan says, I have nothing to do with you. And then as the ayah mentions, then they will both be, that man and the shaitan will be in the hellfire. But this is how he works, brothers and sisters. He doesn't come to us directly. He comes to us in stages. One of the examples of the scholars is that the, the tricks of the shaitan is like what the Arabs used to do for their camels and before they were going on a long journey. If they knew that they were not going to have water every single day, first they get their camels used to drinking, going without water for five days, then six days, then seven days, little by little. Get them used to five and then give them water on the sixth. Used to five, water on the sixth. And then make it Six days without water, one day with water. Six days without water. Once they're used to that, seven days, little by little. And this is the way the shaitan works with us. He doesn't come to us and tell us to do the big things. He starts at the little things. And he starts to make us overlook them. And he starts to make us belittle them. And he starts to make us think about whatever strategy it is that he needs to come to us with. Whatever it is, he might say to us, oh, just do it and you'll make tawbah. You'll do this, and then you can make tawbah because Allah, your Lord is a forgiving God. And then we believe it, and then we fall into those traps. And the problem, though, is, is that another one of his tricks is despair from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are human beings. 
Only the prophets of Allah are protected, ma'asum, from committing the haram. So it's conceivable and it happens for us as human beings to fall into the haram. We're not creatures like the angels who, who uh, they don't do any isyan, any disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not human beings like the prophets that they can't even think about wanting to do the, the haram. We are the human beings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created, given us free will, given us the, noble, the nobility and the dignity that he began with Adam. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ And then when we fall, and then when we trip, Allah has the doors wide open of mercy and maghfirah. But when the shaitan makes us trip, he doesn't want us to go back, he wants us to keep going. Well now you did this haram, there's no way out for you, so do the next haram. And the, do the bigger haram, and do the bigger prohibited thing, until we feel as if there's no turning back. But brothers and sisters, there's always turning back. The door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the mercy of Allah, His forgiveness is always, opening, is always open. And that's why He says, do not have despair, yes, from the rahmah, from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the things that the shaytan loves to do for the believers, لِيُحْزِنَ الَّذِينَ amanu, To make them sad. He loves to make us sad. This is why it's from the adab, from the etiquette of dreams, that if we see a good dream, we tell our loved ones. But if we tell a bad dream, which is most probably from the shaytan, if we see a bad dream, we're not supposed to tell other people. Why? Because the shaytan succeeded in us during our sleep to make us feel bad. And we've all experienced that. But why make somebody else feel bad about that dream too? And spread the sadness, spread the hate that shaytan is trying to bring to the hearts of the believers. And what greater sadness can he put in our lives than having despair from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To feel that God cannot forgive us for what we have done. So when we do fall, we, protect, we, we begin by trying to protect ourselves as much as we can from falling. But when we fall, get right back up and, say, and make a sincere tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the tawbah, the repentances of his servants and then move on. But learn from our mistakes. Learn from the things that the shaitan has thrown in our path. And learn and know that he's trying to move us up little by little. Other examples in the Quran. The people of Nuh salam, they used to worship idols. Did his people wake up one day and just start worshiping idols? Ya'uqa wa ya'utha wa nasra and the idols that are mentioned in the Quran. No, these are the names of righteous people that used to live at the time of the Nuh's people, before Nuh alayhi salam, and they were righteous believers of Allah. After they passed away, the shaitan said, you remember those righteous servants of Allah? See, he's coming to them through the doors that, that, that make sense to them. He's not saying, don't you want to remember those sinners and those foolish people and the filthy people? No, he's coming, he's saying, don't you want to remember those good people, the righteous people? Make some sort of commemoration for them. Make some sort of statue. And he said, make a statue that looks like them so you could look upon those statues and remember those good righteous people. That's the first generation. He doesn't even work sometimes in our lives. He works generation by generation. So in the first story, the monk that was in his life, in the story of the people of Noah, he's working generation by generation, breaking down faith in a, generationally. So for the first generation who rejected you making statues, no, go ahead and make statues, it's good. It will remind you about the people of Allah. It will remind you about Allah. And then once the next generation comes, the children are raised, they look at the commemoration of those statues, little by little the traditions of why they made them are lost, and eventually the shaitan comes and turns the commemoration into idol worship, to worship of these people as gods. And that's this, the generation that Nuh salam was born into. And he had to remind them about who these people were originally, what faith they were originally. But he had to break down these little steps these, that shaitan had taken to remove iman from the faith of a whole community. So when we look at the, the strategies of the shaitan, we have to look at our own personal level, and then we have to look at as a community and see what is happening to us as a community. So when we come to matters in our lives, in our personal lives, as a community, we should not just be thinking about what's, what's going to happen now. We should be thinking generations down the road. What could this lead to? What could this lead to? As an example, and not to get into a fiqhi discussion in a, in a Jum'ah khutbah, 
But there's always around the time of the celebrations, especially the, the past celebration that just happened this week, people coming out and saying it's haram, people saying it's permissible, seeing, and going back as in terms of a fiqh discussion. Can we celebrate it? Can we not celebrate it? But I didn't see anybody, and my, I didn't do an extensive search of what people were talking about this year, but I didn't see anybody looking and saying, even if it is permissible, even if we were to suppose, let's just suppose that it's permissible, is this a trick of the shaitan? Is he getting us used to something and then later on, maybe a generation down the road, that something else will become and put in its place? Because the tricks of the shaitan, just look at what he did with the monk. He didn't tell him at first to do something haram. He convinced him to do something permissible. But that person had put up leaving of that permissible action as a barrier between him and the haram. Multiple barriers. Multiple barriers. Sometimes people say, what's the point of an of a adab? If this is adab, or it's a sunnah. Or if we hear the, the term, and we should be very careful of this, it's just sunnah. It's just sunnah. It's not fun. I don't have to do it. The ulama have discussed this. What is one of the many wisdoms of the sunnahs? They said, imagine your iman is in a fortress, and you have multiple walls around that fortress. Multiple walls. If each wall is there, then it prevents invasion of the, take, the, the seat of Iman. And that's what the shaitan is trying to get. At the core of that is the faith. The first wall is the farm, the obligation, the obligations that we have to do. The next wall are the sunnah, are following the sunnahs of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The next wall are the mustahabat, or mandubat, or nawafil, extra acts that act as another barrier. And then after that, the adab having etiquette, the subtle things that we are doing in our day-to-day -day life, the subtle things in our interactions, the subtle, subtle things in our ibadah, in our worship, these are all multiple walls. So if we let the first wall of adab fall and say, I'm just going to work on the, the basics, the, the, the sunnahs are enough for me, then we let those walls fall. Then the shaitan can come and then he can say, well, let those sunnahs, it's just the sunnah, it's just the sunnah. He'll say, it's just the adab until we let that barrier fall. Then it's just a mandub and until that falls. And then it's just a sunnah until that falls. And then when it comes to the fard, it's a little bit more difficult. And he works his way up from simple things. He works his way up from very simple things in our worship and, it, and breaking down this wall. And then when the wall of, of the fard, of the obligatory actions falls, now he has access to our iman. And this is how he works, brothers and sisters, in an individual basis and in a generational way. Now, in studying this, there's two ways we can approach it. One is looking at the words of the ulama. And the ulama have written extensively about the tricks of the shaitan. So just like there's the strategies of war and strategies of corporations and strategies of corporate takeover and people study them so that when they're actually in that scenario, they'll know what to do. You study it from a theoretical aspect and then go into the practical in your life. The ulama of the, of the Muslim ummah of the Muslim nations have also written books about this, about what are the tricks for the various people. Because they said there is not a single person except that the shaitan is going to bring tricks to him. So the first trick is to feel that we can't be tricked. The first trick is to feel that we cannot be tricked. And then we let our guards down. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in, in terms of our uh, interaction with the shaitan? Take him as a aduwa. Take him as an enemy. And if we believe that this is an invisible enemy that is on guard trying to attack us 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, then why would we let our guards down at any point to an invisible enemy that has access to influencing our, our thoughts? Why would we let our guards down? So we study what are some of his tricks that the ulama have mentioned. And just as an example, one of the things that the, 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 the ulama have mentioned is that if a person has an inclination towards speaking about the deen, at first the person might say, I don't want to be known by the people. I don't want to be known by the people. I only want to be known by my Lord, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want to, be, to remain humble. So the shaitan will come to him and say, no, you have knowledge. The people will benefit from your knowledge. And so he gets them out to start talking to the people. This is just one example. And then he'll come to him and says, you can't just talk to the people. You have to impress the people. So you need this clothes and these things and this other things. And you need to speak like this and speak like this. And then he gets him so caught up 
in the teaching, now he turns him into a person with arrogance. With a person that thinks that he's teaching to benefit the others because he doesn't need to be benefited, which makes him feel that he's better than those listening to him. He gets him to feel that he's that, that, that the important thing is for people to see him. Because before his interaction was between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So his taqwa, his fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was in the zahir amongst people and bil ghayb. Allah reminds us to have khashya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bil ghayb. Have khashya, fear Allah when people can't see you. So if we are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we fear him and we follow his commands whether people see us or not. But if he gets us used to looking for the eyes of the people, then we will begin to have taqwa or uh, uh, practice taqwa outwardly only for the eyes of the people. And then when we're in private, then the shaitan will play tricks on us. So this is one of the tricks that's mentioned about the ulama, the people of ilm and the people of salah. And the, and the story mentioned in the Quran was about a abid, a person who was in deep worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should not think that the tricks of the shaitan are only played on the people that are out there doing things. The reality is that if somebody's already in motion, in disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the shaitan may have just set him in motion, but now he's focusing on those people that are still holding on to their taqwa and now working little by little to break those barriers down. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us protection. في الظاهر والباطن أعود لهم إن ورد for all from all of the مكائد of the شيطان and we ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to protect us from the خواطر from the thoughts of the of the accursed شيطان. بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد فيا عباد الله أوصيكم وأوصي نفسي بتقوى الله تقوى الله السري والعلانية Dear brothers and sisters, we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we send peace and blessings upon our noble messenger, the last and final messenger of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and upon his companions, all his wives, all of his companions, his wives, and all of those who follow him until the day of judgment. And I enjoin you and I enjoin myself to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala outwardly and inwardly. I began by reminding us of the story mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, the likeness كمثل الشيطان إذ قال للإنسان كفر فلما كفر قال إني بريء منك إني أخاف الله رب العالمين إني أخاف الله رب العالمين like the shaytan who told the person disobey or have kufr disbelieve in Allah سبحانه وتعالى and then when he disbelieved the shaytan says I am free I am absolved of you and the shaytan didn't do this immediately he built him up to this the other thing to remember is that one of the letdowns is that when this person put his trust into the shaytan, the shaytan said, I have nothing to do with you. Now he was lying. And I remember when I studied the tafsir of this with one of my shiuch, I said, but he said, inni akhaf, inni akhaf, akhaf Allah. The shaytan says, I fear Allah. I said, does the shaytan really fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He said, Rami, read the ayah right after that. فَكَانَ عَاقِبَتَهُمَا أَنَّهُمَا فِي النَّارِ خَالِدَيْنِ فِيهَا and then the final state of both of them is that they're eternally residing in the hellfire. So he lied. He said, he kedib, kedib. And one of his names is the liar. So even when people put their trust in the shaitan and all of the, the, the promises that he makes, he will let them down and he will show it to their face. I'm letting, I'm letting you down. Another insult, adding insult to the injury. He made us fail. He made us trip. And then he'll say, I have nothing to do with you. But this is a powerful lesson for us because we should not focus when we fall. We should not focus on just blaming the devil, blaming the shaitan. Because in reality, who is the ultimate enemy of us? Who is our ultimate enemy? It's ourselves. Always in the discussion of the tricks of the shaitan, it's immediately followed but by the lesson. And do not forget that it's yourself, your nafs, that's your worst enemy. If we forget this, then we'll put everything on the shaitan. It's his fault. It's his fault. It's his fault. What is he going to say? I have nothing to do with you. He suggested it to us. He didn't force us to do anything. If we go before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, the shaitan made me do it. The shaitan took, uh, took control. The shaitan took over, took over me. That's not going to be an excuse. Because as long as we have our intellect and we're sane, we haven't gone into a state of insanity because of some sort of overwhelming uh, taking over. As long as we have our intellect, we are responsible. 
and la yukallifullahu la yukallifullahu nafsan illa wus'aha allah will not give us a burden more than we can carry so if it's, if the shaitan is placed in our path and he gives us our those thoughts to do things it's not more than we can bear we can reject those thoughts allah has given us the ability to reject those thoughts when we accept those thoughts from the shaitan it's our fault and our responsibility and we cannot put blame on the shaitan and the blame game is one of the games that the shaitan does. He blames Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his fall. His fall that was caused out of arrogance, he blamed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we don't get into the game of blaming people, blaming other people, blaming others. At the end of the day, we have to take responsibility for our own individual actions. So sometimes when we're dealing with things in life, it may be a trick of the shaitan, but it also may be a trick of the nafs. And there's a study of the khawatir, of the thoughts that come into the heart, and how to distinguish between them. How to distinguish by, is this something from the shaitan, or is this something from my nafs? As an example, one of the things they mention is that the primary goal of the shaitan is to get you to disobey Allah. Because that path of disobedience will lead you ultimately to kufr. Or could ultimately lead to kufr. The goal of the nafs is just to get its shahwa, just to get its desires complete. And so one of the examples they may mention is that if the thought is coming constantly, constantly, constantly about one thing, it's most probably from the nafs. But if it comes from multiple angles, do this. Oh, I can't do that. That's haram. Do this. No, I can't disrespect that person. Do this. If it's coming from multiple angles, it's most probably the shaitan. When we realize that it's from the shaitan and we do our dhikr, what happens? He's the waswas. He's the khannas. We ask Allah to, see, to give us refuge from the khannas. He's the one who, his whispers and his thoughts that he gives to us are withdrawn when we do the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the adhan, the beautiful words of the adhan are mentioned, what happens? He runs away. When the Quran is recited, what happens? He runs away. But what are we left with during the adhan and during the recitation of the Quran or while our tongues are engaged in dhikr? We have our nafs. We have ourself. It doesn't run away at the dhikr of Allah. It doesn't run away from the Quran. So the tricks of the nafs could always be there. So we have to learn how to deal with them. We can either study it, or we could just be on guard and use the God-given intellect that Allah has given us and saying anything that pulls me away from Allah, anything that pulls me away from the Messenger of Allah, anything that causes me to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anything that I would be ashamed of doing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in front of the kiram and katibin that are with us all the time, these noble scribes, these creatures and servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who never disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who are with us all the time, are we not ashamed to do things in front of them? If we use that, we don't even have to study all of the books. If we just have haya from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, modesty and shame in front of Him, and modesty in front of the, uh, the, the, the angels that are around us, we can increase in our closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we can distance ourselves from the khawat and from the thoughts of the shaitan. And they are all around us, brothers and sisters. They're all around us. And look... At the generational change, look at the media. Just like the shaitan was able to change the, the, the believers of Allah from the time before Nuh into a disbelieving people, look at how the media is changing people. Look at how the media is making so many things, atheism acceptable, zina acceptable, and the Muslims are falling right in line with this. So we have to look at what's happening in the media. We have to look at what's happening in the society and take active steps in our lives and in our communities to make sure that the shaitan is not taking us in these baby steps towards the ultimate goal of kufr. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the, the, the worst of the, the fates of, the, of, of having kufr in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, disbelieving in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us best, uh, ahsan of titan, to give us the best of seals, to allow us to live our lives in iman, and no matter if we fall and if we trip, that we get back up and that we end this life with La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our final words and our final belief that there is no God except Him and that the Muhammad is and that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.